He was mine because he says, I'm not working because I didn't see you coming. Now, <laughs> let me ask this question. Has there anybody, probably not in this group, anybody ever, when the boss wasn't around, maybe just the slightest moment of time, kind of goofed off? Anybody ever? Oh, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> raise your hand. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad we're honest here anyway, huh? Well, from the very beginning of Christianity, way back to Jesus, there was this belief that Jesus was going to return and that we needed to be watchful, that we're not supposed to be goofing off. And so in 1 Peter 4, 7, it says this, he says, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. So the title of this sermon today is The End. Or to put it in the words of the Warner Brothers cartoon, that's all folks. Right? Remember that? Well, so back in the year around 62 AD, Peter says that the end of all things is near. Well, like, how near was it? I mean, it's been 2,000 years. Well, they asked that question back then too. And so in Peter's second letter, he responds to that. This is what he says in 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 3 and 4, this is his second letter. He says, they will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. And he answers the question by saying, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So he answered that question. He didn't say Jesus coming wasn't soon. didn't say he wasn't coming. He just said that Jesus is going to come. The world is going to end in God's time. If we take that literally, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand a day, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. If we take that literally, which I don't think Peter means us to take it literally, we're only two days in the process, right? So anyway, we need to live with this expectation that Jesus is going to return, that his kingdom is among us, and really at any time, that kingdom can burst forth into this world, and he can set up his glorious kingdom. So there's this idea of this imminent return, it's called imminent return, that is, it can happen at any time, it's just, it's very close, it can happen at any time. And here's a cartoon, it's up there, of course I can't see it, because I can't see the screen, but I believe it's up here. There's a cartoon. This guy is saying, the end is near. The other guy walks up to him and says, so is that a good thing? Or is that a bad thing? Well, for those who have faith in Christ Jesus, that is a good thing. That is the hope. That is the blessed hope, as they call it, of Christ's return. Well, he will set up his glorious kingdom. And everything that is wrong will be made right. And he will rule in absolute, perfect righteousness. So we're certain of his coming, but we're uncertain of the time of his coming. Understand that we are to continue living. We, we, we expect Jesus to return at any time, but understand that we are to continue living and planning for the future. Now there's a guy standing up there saying, someone told me Jesus was coming, so I'm going to stand right here and, and wait for him. So I don't think we want to predict this. The latest prediction, not the latest, but one prediction was May 21st, 2011. Did anybody see the billboards? People were so sure that he was coming at that time that they sold their property, they sold their houses to buy billboards, to put billboards on. That's how sure they were that he was going to come. The Matthew says very clearly, no one knows the day or the hour. So we have this expectation of the end of the world. It doesn't look like anybody's panicking here, huh? We don't want to do that. I remember in California, you know, back in, I would move to California, I think it was 85. Back in 1985, you heard a lot about the big earthquake in California. The big earthquake where the San Andreas Fault was going was to was was split and California's going to fall into the ocean. Anybody ever hear that one? You don't hear it as much. But in 85, I go out to California, I'm sitting in a meeting, and all of a sudden, the building begins to rumble. And the chandelier starts going like this. And it's funny how everybody looks at the chandelier when you're in the room. So we're all looking at the chandelier. And 
I'm, I'm new there. And in the back of my mind, I, I experience this panic, thinking, is this the big one? Is this it? Am I going to end up in the ocean? Well, it wasn't the big one, obviously. But God doesn't want us to panic. He doesn't want us to predict. But He wants us to be ready. He doesn't want us to retreat to the desert and wait for Him to come. People have done that. I'm not a desert person. I would retreat to someplace a little bit nicer, like, I don't know, Missouri, you know, southern Missouri or Tennessee, where there's nice green grass and hills and lakes. We wouldn't want to retreat to the desert. But God doesn't want that. But He wants us to be aware that this world that we live in is not going to last forever. He's going to return instead of His glorious kingdom. And what about my personal end uh, of someone in the, in the church here, their, their mother died and went to the funeral yesterday, the memorial service, and she was only, I think, a year and a half older than I was. You know, our end will come. Everyone who's been born, born has, has passed, they've ended. Here's a picture of St. Francis. And, and St. Francis is oft, often pictured contemplating a skull. So what was, why was he doing that? Was he like a death metal guy or something? Or was he morbid? Well, no. St. Francis uh, is pictured doing that because he would meditate the end of his life. And meditate on how, how short life really was. And that would motivate him to be more passionate and following Christ. Now we see a lot of guys and a lot of ladies with skull t-shirts and skull tattoos, maybe something like this. And so when you see someone like that, say, brother, I encourage you, I see that you're contemplating the end of your life so that you may follow Christ more closely, right? And then depending on how menacing he looks, you might want to run after you say that, I'm not sure. But, but life is fragile, it's unpredictable, it's unexpected, so what do I do? Well, I don't panic, but Peter gives us a pretty good bucket. That's the list that we're all supposed to complete in our lives before we actually kick said bucket, before we actually end. And whether the world ends first or I end first, it's going to come to an end. And so these are the things that God has called us to do, that Peter talks about, that we need to do before the end comes. First of all, he says in 1 Peter 4, 8, we're to love deeply. Above all things, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. So he says, above all, this is the most important thing that we do. When we're setting up the sound system or something electronic that doesn't work, what is the first thing that we check? Is it plugged in? You'll be amazed at how many times it's not plugged in. The first thing we do is make sure it's plugged in. The first thing we do in life is that we love deeply. And grammatically, what it says here is not that we don't love. Peter is saying that you do love, but now to love more deeply. With the end in mind, to be more fervent in your love. Because love covers a multitude of sins. I love this verse. Because it means that I can make a few mistakes in, in my day, and at the end of the day, I've done more good than harm if I could love deeply. We all make mistakes. We all sin. And when we sin, we there's consequences to sin. I mean, we hurt people. We make people angry. or We, we discourage them. They have to forgive us. But when we love, we set, we set in motion a more powerful thing. It is the force of love. And when we love deeply, Peter says, we cover a multitude of mistakes, a multitude of sins. Now we have a lot of parents here in the audience, and maybe you're wondering someday, will my child be in therapy trying to overcome my parenting? I hope not. But I, I, I mentioned this before, but this is something that I really hold on to. I heard this family therapist, he said this is all kinds of of views of how you should raise your kids, all kinds of parenting theories, and as parents, we'll always make mistakes. But there's two things. If you accomplish these two things, then your parent, parenting will be successful. That is to, that, you're, that you love your children, and that your children know that you love them. 
If you do those two things, then you're going to cover a multitude of parenting mistakes, and your parenting will be successful. So above all things, is to love and to love people. If I love deeply, I cover a multitude of mistakes. So at the end of this world, or the end of my world, or whatever comes first, if I can look back, and I can say that I love people around me, and those people knew that I loved them, and the consequences of my love was greater than the consequences of my mistakes, then I can say that I had a successful life. I had a valuable life, and my life glorified God. Peter gives us a very practical way of showing love. He says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. A practical way of loving each other. Be hospitable. Hospitality was very important in the ancient world. Because most towns, most villages, they didn't have hotels, they didn't have motels, they didn't have restaurants. Only the largest cities would have that. So as travelers came walking through, as they traveled, it would be nice for people to be hospitable. Christians were known in the ancient world to be incredibly hospitable. In fact, if you were a Christian, you could travel almost anywhere in the Roman Empire. And you would find some place to stay. Because Christians had this value of being hospitable. In fact, some people took advantage of it. They would pose as Christians and just kind of travel the world. And in fact, they would pose as prophets. In fact, there's an there's a, uh, ancient document that goes back to 100 AD. It's like this same time as some of the New Testament writings. It's a manual for how to live in this world as a Christian. And one of them says, if a prophet comes to your town and he prophesies a banquet, in other words, that you're supposed to create a banquet, and he partakes of that banquet, then he's a false prophet. In other words, that people would come around and they prophesy a banquet, a false, you know, someone who's not a Christian, and, and then he would pig out and uh, then move on. And so this document says that if he does it, he's a false prophet. Anyway, we have hotels, we're surrounded by motels and restaurants. Uh, but God has called us to be hospitable. But I think in many ways God has called us to be hospitable. Not in inviting people into our house, which is certainly important, but inviting people into our lives. Thinking, always making room for someone in our lives. Sometimes we can say, I have all the friends that I need, but God always wants us to make room for somebody else. Be hospitable. Be hospitable without groaning. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. We're going to start this program. It's called Dinners for Six. We're going to have as many people sign up that will sign up and divide you into groups of six. And then over the following three months, then you uh, have dinner with people three times in someone's home. So three different homes in three months. There will be couples and also single people. And a great way to show hospitality to each other and also a great way to get to know each other. So with the end in mind, in view, Peter says to love deeply. He also says to serve faithfully. 1 Peter 4.11 says this, If anyone serves... <coughs> They should do so with the strength God provides. 1 Peter 4, 11. It goes along with being hospitable, to serve faithfully. There's a story of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa walks into this home for the gravely ill, one of her homes that she has in Calcutta, India. And people are there, and they're done. And she sees this young nun, and she's attending this older woman who's, who's dying. And she has a terrible wound and gash in her neck and down uh, on her shoulder. And it's covered by maggots. That, that, that's pretty bad. I don't know if you've ever seen a piece of meat covered by maggots. But it'll take away your appetite, believe me. So this nun, she has a pair of tweezers, and she's standing as far away as she can from this, and she's picking them off one by one. And Mother Teresa walks over to this young nun, and she pushes her out of the way. She says, that's not how you do it. So she takes this instrument, and she puts her, her face right down by the wound, and she begins to scrape off. And she's scraping off the maggots. The, the odor's not that good. 